I've always likened the internet to a Wild West of sorts. There's a chaotic element to it that makes it so incredibly engaging and entertaining. It's the unknown of human interaction that draws you back in again and again and again. And it doesn't matter what kind of a site you're on, whether it's a social media platform or a content site, an image board, or a forum. It's that unknown element of interacting with another person from a different walk of life that is a major part of the appeal. You don't know what they're going to do, what they're going to say, what they're going to link to. It's completely and utterly random from your perspective. And there's an excitement about that that's integral to what the internet is. It's integral to human interaction at its core. And for a long time, the internet's been like that. But we've seen a shift take place over the last five or so years from what the internet was into what it's going to be, into this Frankenstein Orwellian nightmare that's awaiting us just around the bend. You've already seen small glimpses of where it's going, but I think it's important to talk about what the hell really is happening right now and what it means for the next decade. Because if you really don't start to pay attention at this point, you're never going to get it back. The situation most of us find ourselves in at the moment is what I like to call the result of a serendipitous conspiracy. It's not that a group of people got together and decided this is the end goal, this is what we're going to do, but rather that groups of people with similar interests in mind saw one another working towards that goal and threw their weight behind one another. And among these are three primary groups, the government, corporations, and social justice warriors. And while each of them have different reasons for why they are doing this, the end result will be the same. Censorship. You being silenced, not being able to speak your mind or say the things that you want to say. Now, we've already seen a major portion of the government's hand in this, played out publicly. You had the Snowden leaks, you had the Der Spiegel articles, you had people like Applebaum and others speaking publicly about what's going on, about programs like PRISM, where the NSA wants to have different corporations work with them to monitor you in every single aspect of your daily life. If you're using a piece of hardware or software, they're going to find some backdoor or some means to surveilling you and even curtailing what you say. This has been talked about now for years. This is probably the most openly known component of what's happening right now. When you look at those leaks, when you look at the information that's come through, all these different companies decided to jump on board with it. They didn't care about your rights. They didn't care about free speech. They just did what Big Brother told them to do. Apple, Google, Microsoft, every single one of them decided to fuck you as hard as they could without really giving any consideration on whether you'd like a little lubrication before the anal. They just don't care. A lot of people seem to think it's just software related, or it's just an internet service that's being compromised somehow. No, it's your hardware too. Listen to uh, this excerpt that uh, Applebaum talks about. I want you to really listen to this to get an idea of just how utterly fucked you are in regards to what the government is doing right now. This is an implant called Rage Master. It's part of the angry neighbor family of tools where they have a small device that they put in line with a cable in your monitor, and then they use this radar system to bounce a signal. This is not unlike the great seal bug that Lewis Theremin designed for the KGB. So it's good to know we finally caught up with the KGB, but um, now with computers. They send the microwave transmission, the continuous wave, it reflects off of this chip, and then they use this device to see your monitor. Yep. So there's the full life cycle. Here's the same thing, but this time for keyboards, USB and PS2 keyboards. So the idea is that it's a data retro reflector. Here's another thing, but this one, the Tadri Yard program is a little bit different. It's a beacon. So this is where probably then they kill you with a drone. That's pretty scary stuff. They also have this for microphones to gather room bugs. Uh, for room audio, notice the bottom, it says, all components are common off the shelf and are so non-attributable to the NSA, unless you have this photograph and the product sheet. Now that's the government. That's just one of the three groups, and their rationale for this is security. We've all heard it before. That's why they need to know what kind of cornflakes you ate this morning and what you said to your friend on Instagram last night, because of security, to, to stop terrorism. We all know it's a bullshit rationale. We all know there's a lot more going on to this than what they're saying up front. But that is the line they're sticking to. Now, another one of these primary groups, the second one, is corporations. Corporations are fairly straightforward. Their reasoning behind wanting censorship is money. Good old-fashioned greed. You see, the internet is a massive marketplace. Many, many pairs of eyes to put advertisements in front of. Sure, when it first started out, it was a relatively small thing. And who populated the internet? 
Geeks, nerds, outcasts. It was their gathering place. There was a technological barrier in place, a tech savviness that you needed to be able to use it. But as time went on and technology evolved and hardware and software got better, it opened the doors, it opened the floodgates to more and more people. So you see this brand new marketplace open up. And my God, it is just ripe for the picking. But do you know what makes it difficult to sell somebody a new car online? When they have to look at the comments that say nigger right below the advert. It makes them a little gun shy to advertise on certain sites, on certain platforms. And so corporations have an interest in limiting what is said. They need to sanitize the internet. They need to silence you and what you might potentially say to ensure their sales. It really is that simple. They make more money the more mainstreamed and sanitized the internet is. The more control they have over it, the greater their profits. That's part of why you see things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP agreement. Look at what was in that regarding copyright and trademark law, what it allowed corporations to do in regards to governments and individuals. It is a way for them to control and to sanitize the internet to ensure that they make even more money. So you've got the first group that's doing it for security, and the second group that's doing it for greed. What about the third group? Well, social justice warriors in this context, between these groups all working towards this end goal of censorship, are what I like to call the useful idiots. See, the government wants control. They may call it security, but they want control. And corporations, again, very straightforward. They just want to make money. They have two very defined purposes, and they are beneficial to themselves. The third group, the useful idiots, want to sanitize the internet. They want to censor it to create a safe space to protect their feelings because hearing what other people think offends them. And so what better way to stop being offended than to silence everybody else? So this plays into the goals of the first two groups. So while the social justice warrior thinks, oh, isn't it great that the government's getting involved? Isn't it great that these corporations and websites are getting involved? They're mistaking this as altruistic when it's really self-serving. Those two first groups are doing it because it serves them, not because it serves the greater good. But to a social justice warrior, they are too blind to see this. We have seen over the last five years, specifically from this one group, these SJWs, a push to censor everything. Can you name one website that does not now have an amended terms of service agreement about what you can say, what kind of avatar you can use, what kind of name you can use? Facebook has proper pronouns. Twitter now shadow bans you. YouTube now restricts the content you can upload. League of Legends is getting rid of people they deem toxic. It doesn't matter what platform it is. They have influenced all of them. And it is always the same people. Notice who went before the UN. Who was at the Google Talks? Who is friends with people that work at Twitter? It's the same names that pop up again and again and again. People like Anita Sarkeesian, Zoe Quinn, Randy Harper. These are names that are attached to this movement. And it's sold to you as being for your benefit. They're going to make the mean, evil, icky people go away. Somebody said nigger, get rid of them. Somebody said kike, get rid of them. And to you, that may sound great, but their offense doesn't end there. It's not just people that say outrageous speech that offends them. It's people that hold positions that disagree with their positions or who don't uphold their own viewpoints that need to be censored and silenced. You don't call yourself a feminist? We need to get rid of you. You disagree with my viewpoint on white privilege? On systemic racism? You, you disagree with my ideology? You need to be silenced. Because clearly, you're a misogynist, you're a bigot, you're a homophobe, you're transphobic, you're a cis pig. And yet, these are the people that are in positions of power to sway those that have massive platforms and decide policies going forward. To them, this is great. Censorship is the ultimate hug box. When everybody's silent, nothing bad ever gets said. They are useful idiots. Look at the interplay that takes place between these different distinct groups and how their actions benefit each other. Take Twitter, for instance. Right now, there's discussion going on that Twitter is shadow banning people, that they're essentially limiting your ability to speak out and be heard. And it's really an insidious approach. Rather than outright ban you or get rid of you and risk you creating another account, they limit the ability of your tweets to be read by anybody else. They black hole it for 24 hours. So if you say something that's important, it's topical, it's on point, and it's in the moment, nobody's going to hear about it for a day. What's the effect of that? Well, one, it makes you think nobody cares. Two, it dissuades you from even talking about it again. And three, it limits the impact of the information. Now, who does this benefit? Well, it benefits all three. Firstly, it benefits the government. Why would this work for the government? 
Look at groups like Occupy Wall Street. Their ability to have an impact is their ability to get information out quickly, is their ability to swarm that information to many, many people. If you can make it so they can't do that, you've cut the legs out from under them. For corporations, this is great too. They make a screw up, they do something stupid, nobody's going to be hearing about it for a day. The longer they can delay that backlash, the less of a backlash there's going to be. For social justice warriors, it's even better. It makes their critics think that nobody cares what they have to say. It limits their ability to respond. And by creating a wall of silence, a veil of silence, it makes it look like the social justice warrior's voice is the loudest because it's the only one being heard. And all three of these groups are selling this to you like it's for your benefit. And maybe you're on board. Maybe you think this is the right approach. Maybe you want all the bad, icky people to go away, all the hate speech to disappear. Maybe you don't want free speech. You want safe speech. Now, you might say, Jim, you're an asshole. I've looked at your videos. You say horrible things. I've heard you make racist and sexist comments. You've made fun of people. You've trolled people. Why should anybody care what you have to say? Well, you should care because when my form of extreme speech is gone, yours becomes the extreme speech. It is on a downward spiral towards the lowest common denominator. They will find more and more things to be offended by. And they love to be offended. And these perpetually offended people are the ones that want to dictate to you what you can or can't interact with. What is acceptable or unacceptable. They're not asking for your input on it. They're making that decision for you. And that's probably the most offensive part of it all. They think you're too incapable of dealing with that on your own. Because that's how they've been raised. They think Others aren't capable of making these decisions on their own. They don't think you're adult enough to decide what a good or bad interaction is and how to deal with it, so they make that choice for you. And then they claim it's for your benefit, but at their core, they are useful idiots. And I think the saddest thing about all of this is that if the internet is like the Wild West, we're never going to get our moment at the Alamo. We're never going to have that last stand, because it's going to be hard to rally together if you can't even hear the gunshots being fired in the distance.